So, well, thank you everyone for being here in this session about this theory and final growth. Uh, the first talk is by Sam Nariman from the Purdue University from USA that he is going to talk about the few months it's already suitable three manifolds and for these groups action inventory. So all the time is yours. You have for 40 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks um, the organizers for the invitation. Um, I wish I could um, see you in person. Um, but this is also exciting enough. Um, um, so I'm going to talk about a joint project with uh, Katie Mann, mostly, um, <clears throat> about um, group actions on three manifolds. But let me start with uh, some general guiding line uh, uh, for, um, for most of the things that I do. And <clears throat> uh, the guiding line for me is, is the relation between um, algebraic properties of the diffeomorphism group as, as a large group um, to um, homotopical properties of geometric structures on, um, on manifolds. <laughs> uh, just to give you a flavor of um, these type of relations, let me give you two examples. One of them um, goes back to Thurston. <clears throat> and um, Thurston proved the following uh, theorem. So this is um, uh, this was known um, in Thurston's time that the diffeomorphisms of um, of a circle, uh, say C infinity diffeomorphism of the circle, is a perfect group, uh, meaning that um, it's equal to its commutator, um, uh, or every element can be written as a product of commutators. And Thurston, in fact, himself uh, proved um, a general thing that this is true for the identity component of any manifold of any dimension. But um, but perfectness of diff of circle was known, and it's uh, and it was due to Hermann. Uh, but Thurston realized that this algebraic property of this diffeomorphism group um is related to to the fact that uh co-dimension one foliations on, on torus um can be are null bordant are foliated null, null bordant in other words um if you have a co-dimension one foliation on a torus you can in fact uh extend it to co-dimension one foliation on a solid torus um so you, you can you can find a uh, boredism of foliation that bounds the given foliation on, on the torus. <clears throat> so this algebraic property of, of the femorphism group is related to um, a foliation being null bordant. Another um, historically interesting uh, result is due to Philip Kiewicz. And, and he proved the following fact that um, <clears throat> if you consider uh, suppose that you are given a manifold uh, M and you consider CR diffeomorphisms of M. Suppose that you have um, CR structure um, on, on the manifold. Um, so you're, um, um, uh, you have R times uh, uh, differentiable structure on the manifold and you consider the automorphism group of that structure as an abstract group it determines uniquely the CR structure. This means that if you have, if you have another manifold and if you have um, isomorphism abstractly between say diff of R of M and uh, say diff of um, diff S of N, um, if they are abstractly isomorphic, this implies that, uh, well, first of all, R is S and uh, second of all, there is a CR diffeomorphism uh, from M to N. So this group as an abstract group determines the, um, the CR structure on, on a manifold. And, and one way actually to think about um, smooth structure or CR structure for any R on a manifold is is to think of uh, somehow a trivial foliation on a manifold. Suppose that your um, manifold is of dimension N, then foliation by points, uh, which is co-dimension 
n of the uh, manifold, the foliation by points is, is the CR structure um, of the manifold. So you could say that <laughs> this large automorphism group uniquely determines um, the transfer structure uh, to the trivial foliation. Okay, so just in case you um, you get bored um, in a talk, here is a uh, problem to think about. Um, so <clears throat> if you have a um, surface with one boundary component and you have action of the, uh, say, circle on, uh, on the boundary, um, if you could extend this action to the surface, then um, the genus has to be zero. So this is, <clears throat> this is type of the problem that I'm gonna talk about. So you have some action on the boundary and you want to extend it. And this um, gives you some rigidity about type of the manifold that you could have um, as the boardism. So let me get started with the definition. So boardism group of diffeomorphisms. So what is it? This is um, what you expect it to be. Suppose that you are uh, given a manifold M of dimension N and you have a diffeomorphism uh, of M uh, being a little f. We say that a pair of M and F is null bordant. If you have a um, N dimensional, N plus one dimensional manifold that bounds M and you can extend the little f to capital F. Um, uh, as it's here, okay? And so this is this is saying that the group action is null bordant. And when you have a notion of null bordant, you can define basically cobordism group um, by saying that, um, by taking the uh, class of, of a pair, you say two things are um, bordant if there is a bordism between them and you can extend the actions restricting to uh, to the ends, uh, to the pairs that you have. Is, and is, 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 sorry, Sam, is uppercase F also a diffy of W? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, thank you. Yes, uh, so F is, uh, is a diff of W. And <clears throat> so this gives you a um, boardism of diffeomorphism group, and it's usually denoted by uh, delta N. And this was a very, um, interesting object to study. I'm gonna tell you uh, one um, um, particular uh, theorem in this direction, but this was very well studied um, historically. <clears throat> in fact, uh, Craig and Bonahon and Melvin, um, they studied, they calculated this group uh, in different dimensions. Craig calculated for, um, large dimensional manifolds bigger than three. Bonahon did it for uh, actions on surfaces and Melvin did it for three manifolds. And type of the uh, result that uh, they proved uh, is as follows. So <clears throat> for example, if you are given a pair and you would like to see whether this pair is null bordant as um, in, in, in delta N or delta 2K here, um, where the dimension of the manifold is even here, um, he um, <clears throat> found three uh, conditions. One of them is, of course, the manifold should be null bordant. That's obvious. Um, the, the other two, um, <clears throat> one of them is more geometric and the other is more algebraic. So the other one is saying that the mapping torus of F, uh, so the mapping torus is, um, you see, you uh, consider the cylinder over your manifold. So this is maybe M, this is I. And then you glue the other ends by uh, the diffeomorphism that you have F and you get a manifold of one dimension higher, closed manifold of one dimension higher. Um, <clears throat> this is called the mapping torus and the mapping torus also should be null bordant. And one algebraic invariant in the so-called width group uh, should vanish. Uh, this is related to um, what F induces on the middle homology of, F, of M. So uh, Craig's theorem says that if um, the pair satisfies these conditions, then uh, it's gonna be null bordant in the, uh, in the bordism of group actions. 
Okay, um, so this is the type of the flavor that uh, that goes into calculating delta n. But we are interested in in the more um, um, uh, in a more refined question. So let me start uh, by um, the question that was posed by Gs. Um, Gs asked this question that suppose that you have manifold M and you consider the identity component. So this is zero means the identity component. And <clears throat> S, suppose that you have um, C, S structure and M, you consider D, uh, diff S of M. And you can restrict to the boundary, again, uh, to the identity component. Uh, he asked whether this map um, has a section, um, or if it does, uh, what you can say about M, OK? One thing to note is um, considering that it was considering diff zero of the boundary is actually important because when you can when you restrict yourself to the identity component of uh, of a diff of a boundary, in fact, any diff of a boundary can be extended to the uh, diff of M. So R is surjective. Um, so it's not that it. You, you, you may not be able to find a section because R is not surjective. R is surjective if you, um, uh, if you restrict to the identity component. And the reason is easy, in fact, because if you have a diffeomorphism that is isotopic to identity, like F, you can use that isotopy to, uh, to extend it to a color neighborhood of the boundary, uh, like this cylinder. So it goes from F to, um, to the identity. And then you extend by the identity to the rest. Um, so that means that R is surjective, but that doesn't mean that you can find a section, group theoretic section. Okay, so I should emphasize it's a group theoretic section. Okay, <clears throat> so here are um, some of the results uh, towards the G's question. Um, so this is a theorem of uh, Chen and Man uh, that they showed that for C infinity diffeomorphisms, uh, the answer is no uh, for any manifold. And in fact, um, for spheres and disks, um, this um, stronger theorem was was known um, by Herman and Gies uh, himself. Herman, in fact, proved that the diff zero of the circle, C infinity diffeomorphism of the circle, does not act non-trivially on, um, on a two disk. I mean, not only you cannot find a section of the restriction map, um, R, but you cannot even find a non-trivial group homomorphism from D of S1 to D of D2. Um, and and just generalize it to any dimension for diff of uh, diff zero of Sn, and for homeomorphisms, Chen and Man um, recently proved an interesting theorem. Um, their theorem is is more general than this, but this is um, what I chose to uh, say in this direction. They say that if the homeomorphism, again the identity component of the boundary, acts on M non-trivially and the boundary is simply connected, then you have the following rigidity theorem. Uh, so I'm just gonna call this uh, rigidity type theorem. Rigidity. They say that the manifold has to be homeomorphic to uh, disk. So when you have the action, uh, you, um, um, you get the rigidity result about the type of the manifold. Okay. <clears throat> so instead of, so actually inspired by um, G's question, we are gonna, uh, instead of saying that whether we can find a section and we just saw that uh, in many cases, we just cannot find a section. We can ask the same question as G's asked um, about the subgroups of um, diff of um, the boundary. And you can ask two types of question in that direction. I'm gonna talk about both. Um, 
one of them is just a natural uh, generalization of uh, G's question for uh, subgroups. Uh, suppose that, uh, say, um, gamma is a discrete uh, group, and you have a representation of gamma into uh, diff zero of the boundary, then you can ask whether you can lift this um, um, representation or whether you can extend the action on the boundary to uh, to um, to the bordism. But note that here, similar to um, G's, I emphasize that I want to extend to diff zero, okay? You could, um, you could say, uh, I'm gonna relax the problem uh, to extending to a bigger group. And that's also another question. And they are actually different. So uh, you could uh, say that I'm gonna consider uh, the following subgroup of diff of M, which is those diffeomorphisms that uh, restrict to, um, um, when you restrict it to the boundary, you get something that is isotopic to identity. So this is a subgroup of diff of, um, the ambient manifold. And then you could ask um, whether you can lift uh, your representation row to this bigger group. And know that this bigger group might have non-trivial mapping class group. And if you, um, um, if you consider this problem, then you can generalize um, this bordism group that I defined delta n previously, because you could say that I'm gonna say gamma action is null bordant when gamma is acting by the diffeomorphisms that are isotopic to identity. If I can find a manifold that bounds uh, that manifold then you can extend the uh, uh, group action. This leads to, um, again, similarly to uh, the notion of bordism of group actions on say dimension n, so it's decorated by the dimension and the, and the discrete group gamma. If you consider this, uh, the question one, this does not lead to um, the bordism notion, if you think about it. Um, because somehow if you, um, if you think about transitivity uh, in bordism, when you glue bordism together, then you might not be able to um, uh, get diffeomorphism that is isotopic to identity on the ambient manifold, on the bordism. It might give you non-trivial element in the mapping class. Um, so that's why I separated these two questions. Uh, and both are interesting. Um, so I'm gonna say something about um, both of them. So here, let's start with the first question. Maybe I should pause a little and see if anyone has a question. Okay, if not, let's move on. So now my setup is, uh, is the following. Suppose that I have um, a three manifold um, M3 and its boundary is, is a two torus, okay? <clears throat> If you have a representation of some group gamma into um, homeomorphism of the torus that are isotopic to identity, you can assign two uh, Euler classes to them. This is because um, you see, uh, it's known that homeomorphisms of the torus um, are uh, homotopy equivalent to uh, the torus itself. It's given by basically rotations in these two different directions. Uh, well, homeomorphism is, is infinite dimensional group, but it's homotopy equivalent to uh, these two um, rotational groups. And then B, you see B T2 is basically um, homotopy equivalent to CP infinity times CP infinity. So they give two Euler classes of this action. And then when you pull them back to uh, gamma, so this is, uh, this is the rational cohomology of B gamma, or it's, uh, if you're more comfortable with, it's the uh, group cohomology of gamma. So in the second group cohomology of gamma, you have two Euler classes, okay? And here is a theorem.
<clears throat> so, so this is also um, some sort of rigidity theorem it says that if your manifold is not solid torus and you have uh, an action on the boundary so that the two Euler classes are non-trivial, then you cannot extend this C0 action to the manifold. So in other words, um, if the action extends, so in other words, um, if it extends, it says that the manifold has to be uh, homeomorphic to the solid torus. So that's one um, uh, theorem in, in, uh, in the first direction. So here you see, I'm assuming that uh, I'm extending to homeomorphisms that are isotopic to identity. Okay. About the second question. Um, so we define this uh, boardism of um, group actions um, when you act on the boundary by something that is isotopic to identity. Um, it's notoriously difficult to, um, to have a program of actually calculating this group. Um, one, more modest question is whether or not you can find an action that is non-trivial in the Bordism group when it acts on the boundary by something that is isotopic to identity. And so here, um, here is a uh, first example um, that we found as a theorem. Suppose that, um, so there is a, um, there is a uh, interesting subgroup of C infinity diffeomorphism of the circle that uh, is a discrete group that is conjugated to uh, the so-called Thomson's group, Thomson group T. So if you're not familiar with uh, Thomson's group, um, so this is a, um, this is a finitely generated uh, subgroup of diff of uh, the circle, which is, um, which is PL, given by PL homeomorphisms, that have uh, dyadic singularities, meaning that if you if you lift your um, um, homeomorphism to R in a covering, um, you're um, you're allowed to have a singularity at uh, dyadic um, uh, points. Um, so these are dyadic. Singularities and also the slope are uh, dyadic slope. Okay, <clears throat> so you get a PL homeomorphism of um, um, of the circle with with dyadic singularities. This is a this is turns out to be finitely generated group, uh, which is called uh, Thomson group type T, and um, you see already it's a PL homeomorphism. So it's not trivial that you can look at T as a subgroup of same infinity diffeomorphisms of uh, the circle, but this is, this is true that uh, this is due to um, uh, G's and uh, Sergiesco that you can consider a conjugate of T as a subgroup of uh, same infinity diffeomorphism of the circle. And then if you consider G prime times G prime, this is a subgroup of uh, diff of a torus. And uh, we showed that uh, this group, this action is, is non-trivial um, in the Buddhism group of, um, um, uh, in the delta two gamma. So we, so we couldn't find a smaller group uh, that acts on torus. Uh, in the um, in the in the uh, in the um, identity component, so that uh, um, becomes trivial in the in the Bordism group. Um, uh, some of the first example that we found was uh, was this uh, group that uses Thomson's group, um, but nonetheless, it's it's a finitely generated group. Um, okay, um, let me. 
instead of this, say two uh, general theorems in this direction um, that um, that has this uh, Thomson group as a as a corollary. Um, so here is one of them. Um, let's see. So this says that consider uh, two groups G1 and G2 uh, that are subgroups of C1 diffeomorphisms of, uh, of the circle. If they have arbitrary high order torsions, if you can find torsion elements in G1 and G2 of, of arbitrary high order, then if you could extend the action of G1 uh, times G2 on torus to M, again, you have this rigidity result that um, M has to be um, the solid torus. So this is, um, this is more general than what I said about uh, the Thompson group um, here. I said that, um, so there's a difference, but um, this theorem uh, is, is used to show the, the Thompson group uh, example. So Thompson group has um, torsions of, of arbitrary high order. Um, so this already, so this theorem already says that if Thompson's group Thompson's, times Thompson's group can be extended to a three manifold, then that manifold has to be uh, solid torus. But then part of the theorem, uh, the previous theorem says that even solid torus is not possible for the Thompson's group. That's why it's going to be non-trivial uh, in this uh, Bordism group. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, so one has to give an argument why the solid torus itself is not possible uh, in the case of the Thompson group. Um, but this is one uh, one type of theorem, and you see here having torsions of arbitrary high order is is very essential to the argument. Um, if you if you consider torsion free groups. Um, then we don't know how to um, 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 how to prove a similar theorem here, but we have another uh, result uh, which is more uh, cohomological. So that you don't that doesn't use uh, um, torsions. So here um, um, here is a different statement. Suppose that you have a three manifold uh, that is uh, irreducible. And irreducible means that um, uh, you don't have, so if you, uh, so this means that if you have an embedding of a two uh, sphere in M, then uh, it bounds, it bounds uh, a ball, okay? <clears throat> so for example, you cannot have, um, something like this uh, that is given by the connected sum of two things. Uh, so this is, suppose that this is a three-dimensional manifold and then this is S2. Then this S2 does not bound the uh, three ball. So uh, it's not irreducible. So this is, uh, this is a non-example, of course. Uh, so if you have an irreducible three-manifold M, and you have, and suppose that the boundary is torus again. And if you have action of uh, say G1, G2 on, on torus, <clears throat> again, as I said, you can, you can define um, uh, not only two um, Euler classes in, in H, but you get a map from the polynomial ring on two generators in degree two, both of them in degree two, to the cohomology of BH, okay? So note that these two um, have uh, um, degree two. So the hypothesis is uh, suppose that not only the Euler classes are non-trivial, but also the, their powers are non-trivial. Uh, that's another way of saying it. <clears throat> if that's the case, then the action on the boundary does not extend unless the uh, manifold is a solid torus.
So <clears throat> you see, um, this is this doesn't use the fact that the um, group has um, torsions of high orders. In fact, if you have torsions of high orders, it's not hard to show that powers of the Euler class should be non-trivial. Uh, so, um, so this theorem implies the previous theorem um, when M is irreducible, in fact. Um, but that's not necessary. So if you have a group that, that somehow supports non-trivial powers of the Euler class like this, it doesn't have to have um, 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 high order torsions. Uh, nonetheless, uh, that's a cohomological obstruction, um, or you could think of it as a, as, as a rigidity result to determine um, uh, solid torus. Um, uh, before I move on, I should maybe pause and see if anyone has any question. Only if the, these actions of the torus are also in the in the connected component of the identity. No? Uh, this uh, this H yes is in the is a subgroup of uh, diff zero of actually homeo homeo is enough. Uh, yes. Are you gonna? How this is proved or what are the yes. ingredients about? Um, yes, great. So I'm gonna say something about that. I it seems that I only have 10 minutes. Is that true? You you have nine minutes. Uh okay, nine minutes. Uh so I'm gonna uh, breeze through some of the ideas. Uh, so here is a uh, here is one uh, dynamical aspect of uh, using torsions. Um, <clears throat> so if you if you have say gamma um, generated by two elements and um, and having these relations, it turns out that you can embed gamma into this uh, this finitely presented group into d of s one. Um, this was already observed by uh, by Gies. Uh, so Gies used these tricks of using torsions uh, to uh, to obstruct extension. Uh, and then suppose that you have the action of gamma on on the on a torus, but just acting on the first factor and trivially on the second factor. Then um, <clears throat> then you can show that it does not extend to the solid torus by the following type of argument. Um, so <clears throat> if I could extend, that means that I can lift um, the commutator of F and G to uh, D of the um, uh, solid torus. And, and, and here is something to check, but it's not hard to check. Uh, so, First of all, it's going to be um, element of order six. So it's a finite order element. Then you can check that it has a fixed point. This is related to this fact that uh, on the boundary, it only acts on um, one of the circles. And then when, when you realize that it has a fixed point, you, you look at the fixed point and you look at the um, derivative of the uh, commutator is squared when you lift it at the fixed point. You are in three dimensions. So if you have a fixed point and then you look at a derivative, uh, you can find a coordinate system so that the derivative is like this. It's like a two by two matrix and then uh, somehow block diagonalized. And, <clears throat> and then you can see that um, because it has to commute with um, the lift of F and the lift of G. That means that, uh, well, first of all, these two also, um, 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 you know, uh, fixes the, the, uh, uh, the same fixed point. And, and because they have to commute with uh, the commutator squared, 
that means that the derivative has to be in a centralizer of this. But this is some algebraic fact that the cent centralizer of this uh, matrix is an abelian group. This is, this is not hard to check. And because the centralizer is abelian, <clears throat> then you realize that the derivative of this finite order element is going to be identity. And if, so this is another, again, elementary fact that if you have a diffeomorphism finite order, that means that it's conjugated to an isometry of some Riemannian metric. And then if the derivative is the identity at, at the fixed point, then that diffeomorphism has to be identity uh, everywhere, which is not the case. Uh, so um, that's why you, uh, you cannot extend. So this is, this is a flavor of um, a dynamical argument. Uh, since I only have five minutes, let me uh, go to the cohomological part and skip the, uh, uh, this part a little. <clears throat> so how does the uh, powers of the Euler class come into play? Suppose that you have this diagram, you have a group homomorphism from gamma to homeomorphism of T2, and then you want to extend it to M. Um, and every, and suppose that this, this is a group theoretic um, um, diagram. So everything is, uh, is an abstract group, although you have topology and homeomorphism group, but uh, it's an, I'm considering it as an abstract group. Then you get a diagram in the, uh, cohomology of these groups uh, or the cohomology of the classifying spaces. Uh, and this delta means discrete, okay? Means homeomorphism, but with discrete topology. So then you get this diagram and our assumption is, um, is implying that this is injective. And this is actually related to a deep theorem of Thurston. Um, so Thurston um, has a surprising theorem that says that um, um, classifying space of a homeomorphism group of M with discrete topology, well, maps to classifying space of homeomorphism of M with its C0 topology. And this map is a homology isomorphism. This is surprising, but, but uh, it's a theorem um, and we can use it. Um, <clears throat> so that means that in other words, uh, this cohomology of um, homeomorphism with discrete topology is in fact the same polynomial ring that we had uh, generated by two Euler classes. So our assumption says that rho star is injective. So if we can show that the kernel of R star is, is non-trivial, then anything in the kernel of R star is an obstruction to the lifting, okay? Because if there is a lift, then the composition of these two maps, um, R star and the, dot, uh, and the dotted arrow also has to be um, injective, but um, if there is a kernel for R star, that's not possible. So, <clears throat> So you can think of kernel of R star as, as a cohomological obstruction for lifting. And the question becomes, when can we find non-trivial elements there? And here is a theorem. So if M is irreducible and not solid torus, then this map always has a non-trivial kernel. Um, so I want to say something about the proof, but uh, I guess it's, uh, I better stop here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this nice talk, Sam. Uh, if there are questions, just raise your hand. I guess there is no question, but I have a question. I have a question. Yeah. Um, maybe uh, could you say something about 
how you use this irreducibility assumption. I, I'm, I'm imagining it has something to do with this kind of dynamical argument where you're looking at derivatives and you say, well, except this stuff is true for homeomorphisms, but I can imagine in the diff case, you know, you argued that, well, if we have uh, a derivative that's trivial, that you're, you're actually trivial in a neighborhood of that point or something. And then, well, you have a two sphere there that's lurking and uh, yeah. Right, so for the dynamical argument, we actually um, can get rid of this irreducibility um, uh, hypothesis. Uh, but for the uh, cohomological argument, uh, we couldn't, but we, we think that still it should be true. The problem is um, um, we, we completely understand, of course, the left-hand side, the, com the cohomology of B homey of T2. So the question is, can we, can we understand this so that we can say that some of the powers or some linear combination of the powers of the uh, Euler classes uh, becomes zero there? And there we, um, we have a good understanding. This is actually related to an interesting story of the homotopy type of diffeomorphisms of three manifolds. We have good understanding uh, because of the geometrization and the recent uh, solution of Smale's conjecture about the homotopy type of diffeomorphisms of three manifolds when they are irreducible. So um, when they are hyperbolic or ciphered fiber, um, and um, we, can, we can say the homotopy type is given by the isometry of the metric of that uh, three manifold. But if you're not irreducible, then that means that you, uh, so I have a picture here. That means that um, you have a bunch of um, irreducible tori and, and and um, sorry, incompressible tori and incompressible uh, sphere. And you're gluing these irreducible three manifolds. You have to think what that can, how that contributes to the homotopy type of homeomorphisms. Um, and um, this is actually a hard question. In fact, um, there, so maybe I should also mention this. So when the manifold is not irreducible, um, there is a conjecture, not about the homotopy type, but, um, but at least people expected that the uh, classifying space should be uh, cohomologically finite. And that's already enough for our argument because the powers of the Euler class, um, that's not cohomologically finite. I mean, the, the polynomial ring is not cohomologically finite. Uh, if we could say that this is cohomologically finite, then definitely there will be kernel um, uh, when the manifold uh, is not even um, irreducible. But this is this is something that uh, is still open. Cool. Thanks. Just a, a small question: What is the reference for the for the irreducible case? For which result? Um, for the result of of the um, of being a homotopy equivalent to isometries. Oh, this is this is a um, large body of work. Um, it starts with um, Hatcher, um, the proof of Smale's conjecture for S three. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the recent work of Bamler and Kleiner um, mm -hmm. on diffeomorphisms of um, prime manifolds. Um, yes, but um, many people uh, thought about this. The hyperbolic case, for example, is done by Gaboy. Mm -hmm. That's another hard theorem. Okay. Thank you. Well, okay. I think, yeah, we will have time for any other question. So, yeah, really thank you very much, Sam, for this nice talk. So, thanks for the invitation. Mm -hmm. I'm going to